Serving as the culmination of a struggle nearly 2,000 years old, the Palestine Emergency of 1944 to 1948 was a paramilitary campaign undertaken by Zionist underground organizations that sought to unseat the British from the rule of what was the ancient holy land of Israel and Palestine. As a result of the successful insurgent campaign of groups including the Haganah, the Irgun, and the Lehi, the British government would ultimately relinquish its control over the Mandate of Palestine, thus allowing for the creation of a dedicated Jewish state in the Middle East, but in so doing would upturn the political and social fabric of the region and see the next 80 years be paved with blood and war. The story behind the desire of the Jewish people to establish their own land in Israel goes back over 2,000 years to the time of the Romans, where under the conquest of General Pompey, the ancient holy city of Jerusalem and its surrounding land of Judea became a Roman colony during 63 BC. Throughout the course of Roman rule in Judea, various revolts took place that attempted to break the imperial rule of the emperor over the Jewish holy land, including the first Jewish-Roman war of 66 to 73 AD, though these were easily put down by the Roman legions with the siege of Jerusalem in 70 AD, seeing the historic holy city razed to the ground with tens of thousands killed. Over the following centuries, the Jewish population in Judea was gradually whittled down as reprisals saw more of its civilians either sold off into slavery or forcibly dispersed across the Roman Empire, symbolized in 132 AD by the renaming of Jerusalem to Aelia Capitolina under the Emperor Hadrian after which Jews were forbidden from accessing the city. Throughout the Middle Ages and into the Renaissance, the Jewish people were generally transitory, settling across Europe and Asia over the course of a millennia, though due to various persecutions and massacres, their situation in specific locations was not permanent, and often led to them either having to escape pogroms and other mass killings, or being forcibly relocated by the ruling powers. The matter of a Jewish homeland would eventually come back into the public consciousness towards the end of World War I, where centuries of Ottoman rule in Palestine, the region that included what was once Judea, came to an end as the armies of Britain and France, together with the Arab revolt of T.E. Lawrence, forced the Turks out of their colonies throughout 1917 and into 1918. With the entry of the Ottoman Empire into the war on the side of the Central Powers, as early as 1914 the British cabinet had considered the future of Palestine once they had successfully unseated the Turks, with cabinet member Herbert Samuel proposing that in order to curry favour with the newly established Zionists, a nationalist group seeking the establishment of a Jewish state, they should support the creation of such a country once the Ottomans had been defeated. Negotiations between the Zionist leadership and British diplomat Sir Mark Sykes eventually culminated in the Balfour Declaration of November 2, 1917, so named for then British Foreign Secretary Arthur Balfour, in what proved to be the first official declaration of support for Zionism by a major power, and stated that Britain would seek to help establish a Jewish national home in Palestine. However, unbeknownst to the Zionist leadership, Sir Mark Sykes, together with French diplomat François-Georges Picot, had secretly developed their own plan for the future of the Levant following the defeat of the Ottomans, this being known as the Sykes-Picot Agreement, which sought to hand Syria and Lebanon over to the French, while Jordan and Palestine would belong to the British. At the same time, the British, in order to win the support of the Arab tribes, had also promised them the former Ottoman colonies in Palestine, which was instrumental in the formation of the Arab Revolt as led by T.E. Lawrence, though with the enacting of the Sykes-Picot Agreement and the partitioning of the Levant between the French and the British, this was seen as a betrayal by the Arab tribesmen they could do nothing to oppose the plan going through. Initially, the terms of the Sykes-Picot Agreement were that the colonial powers would maintain control of the nations until such time that the native populations could establish their own self-sustaining governments, but with the terms of the agreement being deliberately vague, and with both Arabs and Jews being promised their own lands in the region, no single political movement could be established that would meet the demands of the British. Throughout the 1920s and into the 1930s, widespread Jewish immigration into Palestine occurred, primarily due to the rise of oppressive fascist and communist regimes in Nazi Germany, fascist Italy and Soviet Russia, the results of which were increasing tensions between the majority Arab population and a rapidly rising immigrant faction of European Jews, leading to the formation of nationalist movements within both sides 
that sought to expel either one from what they perceived to be rightfully their land. This came to a head during 1936, when Arab nationalist factions rose up in revolt against both British rule and the mass immigration of Jews into Palestine. The Arab uprising resulting in both armed violence against the colonial and Zionist sides and general disruption through strike action. To support the British in defeating the Arabs, the Zionist organizations that had been formed in the 1920s came to their aid, the first being the Haganah of 1920, which had been established to provide defense of the Jewish population in Palestine when it was considered that British efforts to protect the Jews from the indigenous Arabs were non committal so as to not take a definitive side and alienate the Arab population. The second group was the Ogun, which had broken away from the Haganah in 1931 and formed a far more militant splinter faction for Zionist nationalism in the face of what was deemed to be a softening of tactics by the Haganah leadership, who sought political routes to the creation of a Jewish state rather than violent action. Eventually, the Arab revolt was suppressed in 1939, with 5,000 Arabs killed against 262 British and 500 Jews, while during 1937, the Peel Commission proposed the partition of Palestine between an Arab and Jewish state in order to quell intercommunal violence within the two factions, a move that was considered unacceptable by both sides. Meanwhile, Jewish immigration into Palestine continued to increase, with the British authorities imposing restrictions on the number of new Jewish citizens being allowed to settle in the country. The violent response of the Arab revolt to the ever-increasing number of Jews living in Palestine, culminating in the drafting of a white paper in 1939 regarding the issue of Jewish immigration. The white paper dispensed with the concept of a national partition, and instead proposed a bi-national country with an Arab majority population, while Jewish immigration would be capped at 75,000 new citizens being allowed to live in Palestine between 1940 and 1944 consisting of a quota of 10,000 per annum and a supplementary quota for 25,000 to cover refugee emergencies. This, however, did little to curb the number of Jews entering the country, with most sneaking across the border illegally, while others arrived with tourist visas and refused to leave, or entered into fictitious marriages so as to gain citizenship, though conditions within Palestine were still firmly in favour of the Arab majority who not only were able to dictate the annual quota for Jews legally entering the country, but also had the right to deny Jews the ability to procure Arab land to settle on. By the start of World War II in 1939, it was estimated that over 250,000 Jews had migrated to Palestine in order to escape a wave of anti-Semitic violence across Europe, most of these being German Jews who had seen persecution under the Nazi government of Adolf Hitler, who at the time was orchestrating the Holocaust that would leave six million Jews dead by its conclusion. With the outbreak of the conflict, Zionist organizations immediately took sides with the allies of Britain and France against the persecution of Nazi Germany and fascist Italy, the leader of Palestine's Jews, David Ben-Gurion, issuing a declaration that all Jews should support the British regardless of the 1939 White Paper, with up to 30,000 Palestinian Jews serving with the British Army under what was known as the Jewish Battalion from 1942, as attached to the British Army's 1st Battalion, Royal East Kent Regiment. The Jewish Brigade, together with an Arab battalion, would partake in the Mediterranean scene of the war, sustaining casualties during the North African Campaign, while also being a major element of the Anglo-Iraq War, during which the British, and later the Soviets, sought to defeat the pro-Nazi government of Rashid Ali al qayani in the Kingdom of Iraq during 1941. Though the Haganah and the Ogun both ordered a temporary end to hostilities against the British, not all Zionists were willing to surrender the cause for a Jewish state, regardless of the war, with August 1940 seeing Ogun member Alkaram Stern form another splinter faction dubbed Lehi, which continued to oppose British rule and demanded the immediate formation of a Jewish state. However, Lehi proved to be deeply unpopular due to its pro-Nazi stance against the British. Stern being unaware that Hitler's overarching intention was to exterminate the Jews, this move making him a pariah among the Jews of Palestine, and he was ultimately killed by British police during a standoff in Tel Aviv in February 1942. Before the conclusion of the war, though, tensions between the Zionist factions and the British again mounted, once the atrocities of the Holocaust were uncovered in late 1942 and early 1943 during which the industrial-scale mass genocide of the Jewish populations of Europe were finally revealed, 
alongside the desperate struggle of the survivors in escaping the Nazi death machine. However, the British refused to alter the terms of the 1939 White Paper when it came to limiting the number of Jews migrating to Palestine, with ships carrying Jewish escapees being turned away from the harbours of Tel Aviv and Jaffa, and with the Axis powers now in full retreat, as the Allies retook their conquered lands and marched into Germany itself during 1944 and 1945, the matter of reviving the cause for a Jewish state returned to the fore within the Haganah and the Ogun, the latter of whom sought the cooperation of Lehi. This culminated in a declaration of revolt against the British authorities by the Ogun on February 1, 1944, essentially forming the start of the Palestine Emergency, the Ogun making their intentions known immediately, when only two days later they shot and killed two British constables, followed a week later by a bombing of an income tax office in Jerusalem. The militant campaign of the Ogun and Lehi led to a major crisis within the Jewish Agency, a global organization that intended to see the formation of a Jewish state and sought to assist exiled Jews in their return to the Holy Land, as it threatened to ruin their attempts at seeking diplomatic routes to overturn the rulings of the 1939 White Paper. Therefore, the Jewish Agency, through the medium of the Haganah, started their own campaign against the Ogun and Lehi, by providing information to the British on their safe houses and intelligence on their upcoming actions against British occupation. This, however, did little to stop the violent mission of the two paramilitary organizations, and on August 8, 1944, the group undertook an audacious assassination attempt on British High Commissioner Harold McMichael, ambushing his car and riddling it with bullets, though McMichael was able to escape with his life, the attack leading to British punitive action against the local population in order to root out the insurgents. The assault on the High Commissioner gave the Ogun movement real teeth when it came to the matter of a Jewish free state, as demonstrated when their operatives threatened severe and violent action on the Jewish holy day of Yom Kippur unless the shofar, an ancient instrument carved from a ram's horn, was blown at the Western Wall. The blowing of the shofar had been banned by the British authorities in 1930 in order to quell any violence by the Arabs, but with the Ogun posing a far greater threat through their military action, the British authorities relented and allowed the shofar to be blown on September 27, representing a major psychological victory for the Ogun and the first major concession to be coerced from the colonial powers. A month later, the Jewish agency decided that the actions of the Ogun were likely to do more harm than good for the cause of a Jewish free state, and thus prepared a unit of the Haganah to hunt down the insurgents themselves under what was known as saison or hunting season. Further adding to the desire of the Jewish agency to stop the Ergun and Lehi campaigns was their continued targeting of high-ranking members of the British establishment in the Middle East, as demonstrated on November 6th, when Lehi agents assassinated Lord Moyne, the British Minister of State in the Middle East, outside his home in Cairo, to which the Jewish agency openly condemned the killing. The Jewish agency, though, did not take the notion of Jew working against Jew lightly, and offered deals to both the Ogun and Lehi that if they either stopped or suspended their militant actions, hunting season would not take place, Lehi agreeing to halt their insurgent operations for six months, while the Ogun dismissed any deals presented to them by the Haganah, and thus hunting season commenced from November 1944. The hunting season essentially comprised the rounding up of known Ogun agents and handing them over to the British authorities while at the same time passing to the colonial law enforcement intelligence on Ergun operations and safe houses, leading to numerous arrests and the confiscation of weapons, more than 1,000 Ergun members being handed over to the British by the Haganah during this period. At the same time, the Haganah would establish their own prisons, where captured Ergun would be tortured for information on their operations and areas of activity, this move lending credence to a British suspicion that the Jewish agency was using this action against the Ogun to curry favour with the colonial authorities. Meanwhile, the Ogun leadership blocked any attempted violent response against the Jewish agency and the Haganah, noting that a civil war between the two factions for a Jewish free state would ultimately rob them of their overall goal. Instead, the Ogun would simply go to ground and wait for more militant members of the Jewish agency and Haganah to become disenchanted with their policy against their fellow Zionists, and by the spring of 1945, vast numbers of Jewish agency and Haganah operatives had defected to the Ergun, 
as a means to advance the cause of a Jewish free state, leading eventually to the end of the hunting season in June of that year. With this, the Urkun restarted their insurgency campaign, blowing up hundreds of telegraph poles that wreaked havoc on British communications, though attempts to bomb oil pipelines were blocked by the Haganah, and attacks on government targets were foiled by faulty equipment. In July 1945, the Conservative government of Prime Minister Sir Winston Churchill was defeated in a general election by the Labour government of Clement Attlee, the Labour Party being seen as more sympathetic to the Zionist cause, with their policy going forward being to remove the immigration restrictions imposed by the 1939 White Paper, the Irgun halting their terrorist campaign briefly so as to allow the new British cabinet time to consider the matter of Palestine. Sadly, though, the Labour government reneged on its Zionist policies so as not to alienate the Arab population and to ensure the security of Britain's economic holdings in Palestine, the Jewish immigration quota remaining unchanged, and ships arriving at the Mediterranean ports full of displaced Jewish survivors of the Holocaust being turned back, many of those refugees being held in camps on the British crown colony of Cyprus. In response to this betrayal, the Jewish agency now considered its own military action against the British via the Haganah, and soon the leadership of the agency was opening lines of communication with the Ergun and Lehi to discuss a covert alliance from August 1945, creating, from October, the Jewish Resistance Movement, a unified command structure consisting of members from all three organizations that coordinated their activities. From that month, the combined efforts of the Haganah, Ergun, and Lehi led to a wave of sabotage and attacks on British infrastructure and installations, including a raid on the Atlet detainee camp that saw 208 Jewish illegal immigrants freed, followed by what was known as the Night of the Trains, where the Haganah blew up the track work of the railway system of Palestine at 242 individual locations over the course of a week. Other attacks included the sinking of two British Coast Guard boats in Jaffa, a large bombing of the Lida railway station that destroyed multiple locomotives, and an attempted attack by Lahi members on the oil refinery in Haifa, though due to faulty equipment, the explosives detonated too early and thus killed the operatives orchestrating the mission while leaving the refinery intact. On November 13th, the British Foreign Secretary, Ernest Bevan, further stoked the fire of discontent by stating his intention to maintain the immigration quota, and that it was the only intention of the British government to provide the Jews with a home in Palestine and not a free state, a betrayal of the original ideal outlined in the Balfour Declaration of 1917, and one that infuriated the leadership of the Jewish agency. In response, widespread rioting broke out across Tel Aviv that saw government offices burned and police attacked with rocks, these riots being suppressed by small arms fire that left five dead and 56 injured, and a military curfew was imposed until November 21st, though this did not stop the unrest across Palestine that killed further Jewish protesters. On December 27th, the Urgun and Lehi bombed the CID headquarters in Jerusalem and Jaffa, and the Royal Electrical and Mechanical Engineers Workshop in Tel Aviv, leading to the deaths of six British policemen and four African colonial troops, the outcomes of which demanded an increase in British military presence in the region in order to quell the violence. Moving into 1946, the British began imprisoning suspected insurgents at detention camps across the country without trial, while on January 12th, the Urgun derailed a British payroll train with a bomb that saw £35,000 stolen followed a week later by coordinated attacks in Jerusalem that bombed an electrical substation, the police headquarters, and central prison located in the Russian compound. Violence continued to mount with increasing audacity, specifically targeting highly sensitive military installations, perhaps the most notable for the period being the night of the airfields, where Ogun and Lehi operatives simultaneously attacked three Royal Air Force bases at Lida, Kastina, and Kafar Sirkin on February 25, 1946, destroying 15 aircraft and damaging eight. While the Urgun and Lehi suffered more casualties than the British, with Aiton Livni, the Urgun chief of operations, being captured after a successful series of bombings against five railway bridges, their campaign continued to result in widespread disruption to colonial operations in the region. On April 25th, Lehi fighters conducted a vicious raid on the British 6th Airborne Division in Tel Aviv bursting into their tents and shooting them as they slept, before making off with weapons and other supplies, 
this assault leaving seven paratroopers dead and leading the outraged British authorities to impose both daytime and nighttime curfews, while also punishing the civilian population of Tel Aviv through the closing of all cafes, bars, cinemas, and other places of entertainment and socialization until May 12th. By this point, the British were unaware that the Haganah were operating as a military arm of the Jewish agency, who continued to deny their involvement in insurgent activities and were merely working via diplomatic routes to seek the formation of a Jewish free state. However, following various investigations by British intelligence, it became increasingly clear by June 1946 that the agency was indeed helping to finance and mobilize the Haganah against the colonial government, leading to the enacting of Operation Agatha, which raided settlements and conducted mass arrests in order to find incriminating evidence that the Jewish agency were supporting military action against British rule. Taking place between June 29th and July 1st, the Jewish agency would dub Operation Agatha as the Black Sabbath, with curfews imposed throughout Palestine as British troops and police raided the Jewish agency headquarters in Jerusalem, its offices in Tel Aviv, and other Zionist institutions, confiscating nine tons of documents, while 2,718 Jews were taken into custody and held without trial. Most important to the Jewish agency were the captured documents, as if these were allowed to be read by the British, it would undoubtedly implicate them in their support of a paramilitary organization that was dubbed a terrorist group by the ruling authorities, these documents being stored in the southern wing of the luxurious King David Hotel in Jerusalem, which had been partially requisitioned by the military as their headquarters, though the rest of the building continued to function as a hotel. Thus, the Haganah, in cooperation with the Ogun, undertook a bombing of the King David Hotel in order to destroy the documents, planting explosives beneath the wing of the hotel where they were stored, although as the operatives were leaving the premises, they were discovered by the police, with one killed and another wounded during a frantic escape. The bombs, however, remained undiscovered, and although the Ogun made a phone call to the British authorities, warning them of the impending explosion, it was not taken seriously, and thus on July 22, 1946, a massive blast ripped through the south wing of the building that saw the floors above pancake downward into the basement, the result being 91 deaths that included British military personnel, hotel staff and guests. The bombing of the King David Hotel was by far the most iconic act of the Ogun's terrorist campaign against the British, the ramifications of which would lead to a major crackdown against the Jewish population under what was known as Operation Shark, although due to faulty intelligence, this reprisal action was made against Tel Aviv rather than Jerusalem, as it was believed that this is where the bombers had originated. Regardless, nearly 800 people were arrested, including almost all of the Ogun and Lehi's high command, while head of the British forces in Palestine, General Sir Evelyn Barker, ordered a British boycott of all Jewish establishments, restaurants, shops, and private dwellings. Despite the fact that Barker had led his forces to capture the Bergen-Belsen concentration camp, towards the end of World War II, he was a heavily disliked figure in Palestine due to his openly anti-Semitic views and the implementation of the boycott, which caused severe financial damage to Jewish businesses across the country, thus making him an ideal target for assassination, culminating in a letter bomb being sent to his house by the Ergun, though this was detected before it could explode. However, in the midst of the King David Hotel bombing and the major punitive action of the British under Operation Shark, the Jewish agency formally dissolved the Jewish resistance movement on August 23rd, cutting ties with the Haganah, Ogun, and Lehi, and opting solely for diplomatic routes in order to secure their cause. Nevertheless, while the Jewish agency had officially ended its resistance campaign, they would not condemn or work to suppress the actions of their former paramilitary arms, the Haganah continuing to conduct illegal migrant operations across the border, while the Ogun and Lehi focused on military harassment of the British. While September was quiet in terms of rebel activity, by the end of the month, the paramilitary organizations had once again resumed their campaign against the British, starting with the sabotage of British transport ships Empire Rival and Empire Haywood, which were to be used to transport illegal Jewish migrants to internment camps on Cyprus, followed shortly thereafter by a wave of assassinations. By November, the Ogun and Lehi had become increasingly bold, with bombings and murders happening nearly every day that included the destruction of railways, the mining of roads, 
and the shooting of British military personnel, the colonial forces responding with heavy-handed tactics, including a rampage along Harkon Street in Tel Aviv that destroyed several businesses and left 29 Jews injured. On December 29th, following the sentencing of an Ogun member to flogging in the wake of a bank robbery two weeks earlier, the Ogun responded by kidnapping British officers and soldiers before flogging them publicly in the streets of Tel Aviv during what was known as the Night of the Beatings, the British having been forewarned through propaganda posters that this would occur should the sentence of the court be carried out. 1947 started with ever-increasing swathes of bombings and shootings, the cities and towns of Palestine echoing to the sound of near-constant small arms fire and explosions as the Ogun and Lehi exchanged short but vicious gun battles with British patrols, while the British, in consideration of their vulnerability against the guerrilla fighters, ordered that all vehicles be checked before each use for mines, and that no member of the British staff or military wander the streets in no less than groups of four. In February, the British evacuated all non-essential British citizens from Palestine under Operation Polly, followed, in the wake of a coordinated surgical strike by the Ogun, against the Goldsmith Officers Club in Jerusalem, which left 18 people dead, by the declaration of martial law on March 2nd in the Tel Aviv metropolitan area, with 300,000 Jews being essentially kept under house arrest for all but three hours per day, the British troops being granted the authority to shoot any civilians seen breaking the curfew. Regardless, the Ogun and Lehi continued to operate both within and outside the area of martial law, attacking major British installations as well as sabotaging railways and oil pipelines, a clear indication that martial law was unable to contain the terrorist group, and thus it was revoked after 15 days. Though due to the inability for businesses to operate for more than three hours per day, the economic cost to the Jewish population came to around $10 million. On March 31st, Lehi bombed the Haifa oil refinery, destroying the facility and causing a fire that would burn for almost three weeks this being combined with their ongoing campaign of assassinations and attacks that invoked the response of British authorities against the Jewish population, arrests and internments being carried out all over the country, but this was still not enough to cripple the Ergun or Lehi's operations. On May 4, 1947, the Ergun conducted a highly ambitious prison break from the fortress in Accra, where following the smuggling of explosives into the prison, 41 designated escapees rushed the inner gates and blew them open lighting fires and setting off bombs all across the facility so as to cause enough confusion to cover their flight, this being combined with Ergun members outside the prison blocking and mining the approach roads in order to delay reinforcements. In the ensuing chaos, of the 41 designated escapees, 27 managed to evade capture along with 214 Arab prisoners, while a total of four Ergun attackers and five escapees were killed in their battle with the prison guards and the British response teams. On July 11th, in response to three of their members being sentenced to death, the Ergun abducted Sergeants Clifford Martin and Mervyn Pace and threatened to execute them if the three Ergun operatives weren't spared, the sergeants being held in a bunker underneath a diamond factory that went undetected during two sweeps of the building by security forces searching for the hostages. Eventually, on July 29th, the three Ogun members were executed in Accra prison, which led to Martin and Pace being killed by the Ogun and their bodies hanged from a eucalyptus grove in Netanya, both bodies being booby-trapped with explosives, which detonated as Martin's body was being cut down, leading to the injury of a British officer. As a result of what was known as the Sergeant's Affair, a huge outcry from the British government and public led to widespread reprisals against the Jewish population culminating in a violent rampage by British police on the streets of Tel Aviv that saw five Jewish civilians beaten to death and another 15 injured, while in Britain, anti-Semitic demonstrations led to Jewish shops being attacked and civilians assaulted. However, the sergeant's affair, coupled to the near 100 Ergun attacks that occurred during the two weeks of their captivity, essentially crippled the British will to remain in Palestine, the murder of the two soldiers illustrating that the Jewish resistance would never be broken, and all enthusiasm to maintain control of the mandate dropped away. This led, in September 1947, to the Labour cabinet of Prime Minister Attlee announcing the evacuation of Palestine, and although some attacks continued to occur on British personnel and installations, the focus of the Jewish campaign 
soon turned against both themselves and the Arabs to which the future independent nation would have to be shared. For the internal confrontation, the Haganah, in order to curry favour with an investigative committee from the United Nations as to the future of Palestine, began to heavily suppress the actions of the Ogun and Lehi, so as not to allow them to smear the image of any future Jewish free state, attacking and killing Ogun and Lehi operatives as a means of intimidating them out of action. As for the Arabs, the campaign of the Ogun and Lehi, together with the mass illegal immigration work of the Haganah, had pushed tensions with their population to breaking point, with sporadic bouts of intercommunal violence having taken place throughout 1946 and into 1947, as more Jewish civilians encroached on Arab land. On November 29th, the United Nations, following its review of the situation in Palestine, recommended dividing the country into Jewish and Arab states, as per the United Nations Partition Plan for Palestine in UN General Assembly Resolution 181, the announcement of which led immediately to a collapse of civil order and the start of open conflict between the Jewish and Arab factions. Despite this, the Jewish insurgency against the British continued into late 1947, once again striking at individual personnel and installations, though one notable incident took place on February 29, 1948, when a bomb exploded ahead of the Cairo to Haifa Express that led to a derailment that killed 28 British soldiers and injured 35. Finally, on May 15, 1948, the British mandate in Palestine officially came to an end, and from the following day, the Jewish faction ceded from the Arabs by declaring an independent state of Israel, thus leading to the immediate start of the 1948 Arab-Israeli war between Israel and its neighbouring Arab states. The British evacuation from Palestine and the partition of the country between Jewish and Arab states was not one accepted by the British government, with the Labour cabinet in London seeking to make clear to the Arabs that they were not responsible for the proposed UN partition so as to keep favour with the leading political class of the Arab community, in particular the controversial Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, Amin al-Husseini, who had once sided with Nazi Germany and fascist Italy in order to combat the Jewish threat in Palestine. At the same time, both high-ranking officials of the British authority, as well as regular infantry and members of the military force, held strongly anti-Semitic views, the political and officer corps of the British military doing whatever they could to stem the illegal Jewish migrant traffic into the country, while deserters from the British army became mercenaries on the side of the Arab League, alongside former German Nazis who sought to sabotage the creation of a Jewish free state in the Levant. Nevertheless, the Arab-Israeli war had now officially spilled out into open conflict, with Egypt, Transjordan, Syria, and expeditionary forces from Iraq invading and securing Arab regions, before beginning their assault on Israeli forces and several Jewish settlements, while the former paramilitary organizations of the Jewish agency, the Haganah, the Ogun, and Lehi, unified themselves into a standing army against the Arabs, creating the Israeli Defense Force. Despite the fact that the Israelis were heavily outnumbered, their long-standing military experience fighting the British, together with the vast acquisition of equipment, including tanks, artillery, and aircraft, left behind by the colonial forces, meant they could mount a strong defence against the Arab invaders. Finally, after ten months of fighting throughout the former British Mandate and southern Lebanon, as well as across the Sinai Peninsula, the Israelis had secured almost all of the country and fortified their borders by Christmas 1948, leading, in 1949, to the signing of individual armistices with Egypt, Syria, Transjordan and Lebanon, creating a series of Green Line boundaries that separated the Jewish and Arab states from one another. As a result of the war, Israel controlled approximately 60% of the area proposed for Arab settlement under UN Resolution 181, leading to the expulsion of 700,000 Palestinian Arabs from what would become the Jewish state, and the expulsion of 260,000 Jews from the Arab states. The war, in terms of human cost, leading to the deaths of 6,300 Jews against 20,000 Arabs. Today, the partitioning of Palestine into Israel and the Arab states is one that has remained at the forefront of global geopolitics, with individual conflicts in the ongoing Arab-Israeli war sporadically taking place as the Arabs seek to expel the Jews from land that they consider stolen from them under the UN resolutions of the 1940s, while the Israeli government maintains a stalwart defence of its territory. More notable, though, is the continuing humanitarian and ethical question 
regarding the creation of the Jewish Free State, with supporters of both Israel and the Palestinians engaging in ongoing arguments for and against the outcomes of the Jewish insurgency and subsequent Arab-Israeli war. Regardless, the root of the ever-present Arab-Israeli conflict can be placed largely in the actions of the British at the end of World War I, which, through their capture and occupation of the former Ottoman territories of the Levant, in the wake of the Sykes-Picot Agreement, led to an unwinnable situation when trying to resolve the question of which faction deserves to reside in Palestine. Truly, though, no outcome would have been satisfactory, the Jews considering what is now Israel to be their ancestral homeland from which they had been exiled nearly 2,000 years prior, while the Arabs that had settled in the region during their absence were determined not to be uprooted from the territory they now called theirs. Thus, tensions and intercommunal violence were simply an inevitability of either putting the two sides together into a single nation or implementing partitions as per the UN Resolution of 1947, though regardless of the political and military decisions made over a century ago, the modern Jewish and Arab populations of the Levant suffer the consequences of their results today.